morning, ladies. It is wonderful to see faces that I haven't seen in a long time that I'm so thankful to see. It oh, means so much to me, and I, I can't tell you enough what a blessing it is to have each of you in my life. Um, even Anne. <laughs> Even though she gave us this challenging topic, I saw you come in here before, um, that Becky and I both went, oh boy. <laughs> but um, let me tell you, last year has not been easy for anybody, but it's been challenging for me and my family. And reading through this book and remembering that God is sovereign in my life has been an incredible incredible blessing for me and has strengthened me. So thank you, Anne, even though I ribbed you a little bit. Before we dive into I'll scrub the clicker. We'll see if it works. Um into God's sovereignty over people, I want to refresh some foundational truths that Becky talked about last week. Because I think they are so important to keep in our minds as we go through what can be a very challenging topic, especially depending on where we are in life. Um, oh, good. Three essential truths that we need to keep in mind. God is completely sovereign. God is infinite in wisdom. And God is perfect in love. He is all of those three things all of the time, and they work perfectly together. God, in his love, always wills what is best for us. In his wisdom, he always knows what is best. And in his sovereignty, he has the power to bring it about. I mean, amen, sisters, right? Not only that, that God's providence is his constant care for and his absolute rule over all his creation. And these, these are the two things I want you to remember in addition to sovereign wisdom, love. He brings things about for his own glory and the good of his people. Not or, and. Okay? God never pursues his glory at the expense of the good of his people. Nor does he ever seek out our good at the expense of his glory. Good not from a human lens, not the way we think things should work out, but from a spiritual lens. And Linda Main will talk more about that when we discuss the wisdom of God. That was a chapter I particularly love. Um, it's important to keep these truths in mind because if we begin to look at God as sovereign from a lens of addiction or abuse or assault or disease or pandemic or, 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 we will only receive hurt and anger and distance from God. But instead, if we look at God as sovereign through who the Bible says he is, he is wisdom, he is love, he is sovereign. We will receive blessings of peace and confidence and trust in him and a closer relationship with him. We have to be careful not to get caught up in the how or the why when it comes to how God acts in, so in his sovereignty. Job 11, 7, can you solve the mysteries of God? Can you discover everything about the Almighty? Can't even come close. So don't get caught up in the whys. And Dewey's favorite verse, Deuteronomy 29, 29, the Lord our God has secrets known to no one. We are not accountable for them. We are not accountable for them. But we and our children are accountable forever for all that he has revealed to us so that we may obey all the terms of these instructions. 
we're accountable for the fact that he's revealed his love to us, his wisdom to us, and told us to share that with others. Okay, foundational truths. Hold on to those as we get into his control over man, his sovereignty over man, I should say. I'm going to read this part directly from the book. I typed my notes big enough to where I don't have to use these the whole time. Um, but from the book, I do need to use them. Yes, I am getting older, or my eyes are anyway. And this is from the book that I was talking about, Trusting God by Jerry Bridges. Picture yourself in this situation. You've been working for someone all of your life. Your boss has been extremely cruel. Your wages have been barely at subsistence level, and you feel very downtrodden and oppressed. For all practical purposes, you are nothing more than a slave. Suddenly, you are freed from that almost unbearable situation. You are free to leave and start life all over again. There is only one problem. You have no financial resources, no way to make the trip, no funds to start anew someplace else. No way to take advantage of this incredible opportunity. So you go to your boss and ask him for money for the trip and for getting started after you reach your new location. As far-fetched as it may sound, your boss gives you the money. He doesn't give you a little, he gives you a lot. In fact, he gives you so much, he impoverishes himself. Sounds improbable, right? But roughly, that's what happened when God freed the Israelites from Egypt. Exodus 3, 21 through 22. And I will cause the Egyptians to look favorably on you. They will give you gifts when you go, so you will not leave empty-handed. Every Israelite woman will ask for articles of silver and gold and fine clothing from her Egyptian neighbors. And from the foreign women in their houses, you will dress your sons and daughters with these, stripping the Egyptians of their wealth. Completely contrary to their normal behavior. Someone's been a slave to you, you're not going to just give them everything you have. But that is exactly what happened. The Egyptians freely, voluntarily plundered themselves. Exodus 12:36. The Lord causes the Egyptians to look favorably on the Israelites, and they gave the Israelites whatever they asked for. God, in some mysterious way, moved in their heart so that they, of their own free choice, did exactly what he planned for them to do. That was in Egyptian time. The question is, can we trust God today? While I was reading this book, um, Jake's job was in question. Company was changing. We didn't know whether or not he was going to have a job or if it was going to be a job he would be willing to do, one that was going to be that was going to bless us. We were completely in the hands of this mysterious, at least to me, mysterious company in Japan to decide his fate, our fate. So I had to ask, could I trust God that he could and would work in the heart of that Japanese businessman to bring about God's plan for us? Several years ago, my parents were the victims of a home invasion. Middle of the night, three young men broke down their door. And, and robbed them. Um, they were not in their right minds, and it could have been a lot worse than it was. They didn't lay a hand on my parents. Can I trust that God to intervene in the heart of those individuals so that they did not carry out their evil intent? Can we trust God, ladies? Yes, we can. We can trust God. He does sovereignly intervene in the hearts of people so that they make decisions and carry out actions that accomplish his purpose in our lives. 
it is a challenging concept to accept for one big reason, it messes with our idea of free will. Uh, Jerry Bridges says, if God is not sovereign in the decisions and actions of other people as they affect us, then there is a whole major area of our lives where we cannot trust God, where we are left, so to speak, to fend for ourselves. We know God doesn't do that. And we're going to look at scripture to look at some of the ways that he moves. And we will come back in a little bit to that question of free will. But first, does God cause people to make decisions that favor us? Proverbs 21, verse 1. The king's heart is like a stream of water directed by the Lord. He guides it wherever he pleases. God had unconditional, or not God, the king had unconditional and unrestrained rule over his kingdom. It's not like today where we have other systems in place to hold one person in check so that they can't make absolute rule and have absolute authority. During this time, he had complete authority. But the stubborn will of the most powerful monarch on earth is directed by God as easily as the farmer directs the flow of water in his irrigation canals. God is able to control the heart of a king, the mind of a king, of a president, of a senate, of whomever. He's able to control everyone else as well if he's able to control the most powerful. Ezra 1.1 1, 1. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord fulfilled the prophecy he had given through Jeremiah. He stirred the heart of Cyrus to put this proclamation in writing and to send it throughout his kingdom. This was Cyrus declaring that some of the Israelites could go back and could rebuild Jerusalem, could rebuild the temple. The destiny of Jerusalem, of God's people, was not in the hand of the most powerful monarch, but completely in God's hand. Referring again to Cyrus in Isaiah 45, verses 4 and 5. And why have I called you for this work? Why did I call you by name when you did not know me? When you did not know me. It is for the sake of Jacob, my servant, Israel, my chosen one. I am the Lord. There is no other God. I have equipped you for battle, though you do not even know me. Cyrus did not know God. He did not acknowledge God's existence. He didn't have any kind of relationship with him. But God was still able to direct Cyrus's heart to accomplish his will. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Mandisa. She's a Christian artist and she has a new podcast. It's a counseling podcast with her. Anyway, it's right up my alley. But I was listening to it the other day and Mandisa, they were talking about you know, whether or not you should have to go to a Christian counselor, whether it's okay for a Christian to go to someone who is not a Christian. And she said, you know, if God can speak through a donkey to accomplish his will, he can use anyone. I loved that. I was like, amen. Absolutely. God is not limited by anything or anyone. Ezra 1.5. Then God stirred the hearts of the priests and Levites and the leaders of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin to go to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple of the Lord. God not only stirred Cyrus's heart to make the proclamation, he spoke to the hearts of the people so that they would respond as well. God didn't just move in the hearts of people in the Old Testament. Second Corinthians 8 we go we didn't go go thank you second corinthians 8 16 and 17 but thank god he has given titus the same enthusiasm for you that i have titus welcomed our request that he visit you again in fact he himself was very eager to go and see you. titus acted freely yet under the mysterious sovereign impulse of god to go and work with the corinthians I think of it kind of, in my mind, at least for a Christian, 
when the Holy Spirit prompts me to call someone out of the blue to encourage that person. Moving in my heart and my mind. That movement is there, but it's still my free choice to follow that movement, to respond to that movement. Still fascinating. I know. Um, does God restrain people from making decisions that would harm us? We know that he moves people to make decisions. Does he restrain them as well? In Genesis 20, Abraham lied to Abimelech about Sarah, his wife, saying that she was his sister. And Sarah being very beautiful, Abimelech took her to be his wife. But God restrained him. Genesis 20, verse 6. In the dream, God responded, yes, I know you are innocent, speaking to Abimelech. That's why I kept you from sinning against me and why I did not let you touch her. There's no mention of God physically or circumstantially restraining Abimelech, but rather through his mind. Abimelech probably was not conscious that God was doing so, but he chose of his own free will not to be with Sarah. But his choosing was also under the sovereign control of God to protect Sarah from Abraham's sin. It did not excuse Abraham's sin. God did not excuse it. But he did not let that stop God from intervening in Abimelech's mind to prevent the serious consequences of sin. And that doesn't mean God's always going to act in that way. Sometimes we experience pretty serious consequences of sin. But when it is hit for his glory, for the good of his people, he can act in that way. Later in Genesis 35, um, Jacob's daughter, Dina, was raped. And Jacob's sons massacred Shechem in response out of retaliation for the rape. Um, they were in the middle, surrounded by Canaanites, by ki all kinds of people that should have, normally would have taken revenge against such a heinous act. Genesis 35, verse 5. As they set out, Jacob's family set out to go somewhere else. A terror from God spread over the people in all the towns of that area, so no one attacked Jacob's family. Jacob fully expected the Canaanites to take revenge and easily overpower them. There is no external reason why the Canaanites refrained from destroying Jacob and his family, except that God restrained them through a fear that could not be rationally explained. Oh, it's a lot, ladies, isn't it? <laughs> Exodus 34, 23, and 24. Three times each year, every man in Israel must appear before the sovereign, the Lord, the God of Israel. All of the men. Now, at this point, they were settled in the promised land. And they all had their own towns and their own sections. But three times every year, all of the men would go. And that be the equivalent today to our nation shutting down all its commerce, all its educational activities. And most critical of all, furloughing all its military personnel simultaneously and gathering all those people into one giant assembly three times a year. I mean, think how vulnerable and defenseless we would be. They were all set, except for God. I will drive out the other nations ahead of you and expand your territory. So no one will covet and conquer your land while you appear before the Lord your God three times each year. In response to their obedience, God also promised his protection. Not only would they not attack them, but they would not even desire to do so. Because God was sovereignly working in their hearts and in their minds. Ladies, these verses are meant to teach us that God is sovereign over people 
and to encourage us by the knowledge that God exercises his sovereignty for our good. The challenge comes with this next question. Does God permit evil? We know from looking at the news and probably from personal experience that God does not always restrain the wicked and harmful actions of others toward his people. I know we've been looking at Joseph a lot lately on Sunday mornings, but we're going to look at him again. Um, if you look at the life of Joseph, God did not restrain his brothers from selling him into slavery. He did not restrain Potiphar's wife from unjustly accusing him. He didn't restrain the cupbearer from forgetting, or forgetting about him for two years. But in God's time, which for Joseph was 23 years, he turned those circumstances around. God was orchestrating the wicked acts of people exactly as he planned in order to accomplish his purpose through Joseph. Familiar verse to us, Genesis 50, verse 20. You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. Ladies, God is righteous always. He cannot sin and did not cause Joseph's brothers or Potiphar's wife to harm Joseph. Jerry Bridges says, God is never at a loss because he cannot find someone to cooperate with him in carrying out his plan. He so moves in the hearts of people, either Christians or non-Christians, it makes no difference that they willingly, of their own free will, carry out his plans. Their wills, the evil of their own hearts, was already there. God used their desires for his glory and for our good. Psalm 75 verses 6 and 7. For no one on earth from east or west or even from the wilderness should raise a defiant fist. It is God alone who judges. He decides who will rise and who will fall. He is still in control even when he allows evil. Is there an area in your life where you are at the mercy of another person? Perhaps um, waiting for the disability office to approve your disability for four years, like Becky Chowning shared with us last week. Bridget says, God will move in the heart of that individual one way or the other, depending on God's plan for you. That person is simply his agent to carry out his will. That person is not conscious of doing his will and never intended to, probably, unless, of course, they are Christians prayerfully seeking to do the will of God. But that does not alter the result in your life. You can trust God in all the areas of your life where you are dependent upon the favor or frown of another person. God will move in that person's heart to carry out his will for you. Okay. So we'll go back a little bit to the problem, the free will problem, because um, I know it's probably been in the back of your mind. It's, it's a mystery, honestly, exactly how it works out, Deuteronomy 29, 29. But I will say, he says, the Bible asserts both God's sovereignty and people's freedom and moral responsibility, but it never attempts to explain their relationship. However, there's some truths that we can look at as far as the relationship between sovereignty and free will. First of all, God is infinite in his ways as well as his being. Our finite minds cannot comprehend infinite God beyond what he expressly reveals to us in his word. Some things will just remain a mystery, as frustrated as we get with that. Our problem is that we tend to view the interaction between God and human on the same level as the interaction between human and human. We tend to think that God can act upon the human mind only in the same way we do. 
as a counselor in training, I can give someone all of the tools and I can talk things through with them and I can even maybe beg them to make some changes in their lives, but I can never change them. Only they can. Only they can choose to change their will from a human standpoint. But God, the great counselor, does move a person's will, but in such a way that the person acts freely and voluntarily. Next, God is never the author of sin. You see this in James 1, 13 and 14. And remember, when you are being tempted, do not say God is tempting. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. And then in Acts 4, 27 and 28, and this is the prayer that the believers were speaking after Peter and John were arrested and then freed. In fact, this has happened here in this very city. For Herod Antipas, Pontius Pilate the governor, the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were all united against Jesus, your holy servant, whom you anointed. But everything they did was determined beforehand according to your will. God does not cause sin, but he can use our sinful acts to serve his sovereign purposes. But even if he does so, we are still responsible for our actions, both choosing to sin and the consequences of that sin. God judges people for the very sins that he uses to carry out his purpose. Isaiah 10, 5 through 16 really addresses this. And I'm just going to read verse 12, though. After the Lord had used the king of Assyria to accomplish his purposes on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, he will turn against the king of Assyria and punish him, for he is proud and arrogant. It is his pride and his arrogance, the sin, those sins that God uses, but then he still punishes. And then the Bible consistently portrays people as making real choices of their own will, not mindless puppets who have no responsibility for the choices we make. We see that throughout scripture, that we're not mindless puppets. The Bible teaches both the sovereignty of God and the free moral choices of persons with equal emphasis. It is impossible for us to reject either of these great truths and it is equally impossible for our minds to reconcile. Deuteronomy 29, 29. So what is our response to these, these scriptures and to the limitations of our own understanding? How do we respond? Ladies, I hope, first of all, we trust. Rather than fretting and driving ourselves crazy, trying to understand things we are not meant to understand, trust that God has our future in his secure hands. Bridges says, no one can harm you or jeopardize your future apart from the sovereign will of God. Moreover, God is able to and will grant your favor in the eyes of people who are in a position to do you good. You can entrust your future to God. Romans 8.38 I love this verse. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. Hold on to that truth. Trust in that truth. And then, ladies, we can pray. We can look to God in prayer in all those situations where some aspect of our futures lies in the hands of another individual. Obviously, we don't always know how God will answer our prayers. 
or if he will move in the heart of another individual. But it is enough to know that our destiny is in his hands, not those of other people. Hopefully this truth and praying will help to keep us from feeling resentful and bitter when people act in a way that is contrary to what we hope for. God never allows people to make decisions about us that undermine his plan for us. Once again, we have to remember that it is his plan, one formed out of wisdom and love and not our plan, which is one limited by our finite understanding. Zephaniah 3.17, for the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty Savior. He will take delight in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful song. In Romans 8.31, what shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Bridges ends his chapter with some words of caution. The first one is for us to never use God's sovereignty over humans as an excuse for our own shortcomings. We have to examine ourselves honestly. It made me think of American Idol when it was on and you would always during the audition phase see some people that were auditioning that really had no business in auditioning. I mean, they let them on there for, you know, entertainment sake and everything, but those people could not say, God just didn't move in Simon Cowell's mind to choose me. No, no, look at your own limitations. <laughs> Examine yourself honestly. Next caution. It is also not a reason to respond passively to the actions of other people that affect us. We should take all reasonable steps within the will of God to protect and advance our situation. Never look at God's sovereignty as a reason to stay in an abusive relationship. God moves in our minds and our wills as well to help us out of those situations. Then never use God's sovereignty over humans to excuse our own sinful actions or decisions that hurt another person. I can't say, well, I yelled at Jake last night and treated him with complete disrespect. But that's okay, because God is sovereign and he let me do it. No. I have a responsibility to repent and make restoration because God will hold me accountable for how I treat my husband, even if God chooses to use my actions to accomplish his will in Jake's life. Ladies, we do not know what God's sovereign will is. So I want to caution you against telling someone that an event, whether it's favorable or tragic, was God's will. You need to be careful about that. We need to make sure we stick to the things God has revealed in scripture, that God works for his glory and the good of his people, that he is sovereign, he is wisdom, he is love, and he will work to show that love to people. And um, before I end, I want to tell you a story. I just added this because I was talking with a friend yesterday and I'm, it completely fit with this lesson. Um, my friend Valerie is a foster parent. And she, for over a year, had two um, toddlers running around. And they just recently went home about a month ago. And so they've opened themselves up to getting a new placement. And they were looking for a baby. They wanted something easy. Now, in my mind, baby does not equal easy. But not toddler that's running around and causing extra energy and all that stuff. I'm, she's am amazing. She and Denise amazing um and they actually had you know passed up a couple of toddlers who got other homes don't think that they just weren't yeah anyway um so that's where they were well last week 
there was a post on a foster parent page letting the parents in Lubbock know that they were looking for a home for a six-year-old autistic boy who could not speak. He's not potty trained. Um, he was found naked. Um, ladies, that's not easy. <laughs> but both she and her husband, upon reading the post, felt an immediate certainty that they needed to bring this boy into their home. You know, neither one of them had ever said they felt like they heard God speak to them. But they both said they felt like God was directing them to take him in and to love him. And I believe, even though I told you to be careful about, and she believed, about saying it was God's will, I believe he moved in their hearts to show love for that little boy and move in his life. And they're already... It's amazing. It's just amazing the way God works in these heartbreaking situations. But I wanted to share that story. With you. See, we don't know how he will work in the heart of another individual, whether favorably or unfavorably from our viewpoint. But we can have confidence and peace in knowing in either case the person's heart and our hearts are in God's hands. He will direct them according to his sovereign purpose for his glory and our good. And I just pray that we are praying Psalm 51:10. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew, renew a loyal spirit within me that we may be open to his movement in our hearts and 